Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to class today. Uh, I believe our day has been going very well. Mine has been going well. If you can hear me, you can unmute and uh, you just know how your day went. Hello. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. You are welcome, sir. We are so pleased to have you join us today. Thank you. All right, sir. So um, I think we'll just... Oh, good evening, Ma. Good evening, good evening. Good evening. Mm, good evening. How was your day? Yeah, it was good. How was yours? Okay. Yeah, it was fine, too. All right. No, yeah. the day is still... We are still in the day. <laughs> the day is not over yet. But then uh, it is well. Uh, so I think we'll chill to you 505 for everyone to join. Then we'll keep up. So like I said yesterday, um, today I will not be the one taking the class today, but I'll be here. Um, we have an expert in the house, he's a doctor and he's well experienced in the topic we are looking at today. So whoever missed today's class, hmm. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. <laughs> so I think we'll just chill two minutes more, then we'll start fully. Mm. I think we can just kick off. Um, everyone coming in, join us. Will join us later. So once again, I welcome everyone to the class today. I I hope that we have been learning so far. Um, in the previous classes, I hope we've been learning, and I believe also that today is going to be another fantastic um opportunity to learn. Yeah, you know I've been doing it now. So um, today is not going to be an exception, right? Today is not going to be an exception on what we are going to learn also. So um, I think uh, without wasting too much of our time, because I believe we all have one thing or the other we are doing, um, our lecturer today will be teaching us today. His name is Dr. Sambu. He's... Um, is an expert is an ex uh, like an expert in this field. He's an expert um, talking about poultry generally. He, he has a farm and he is here to bless us with the well of his experience. I believe we're all excited to have him. Are we all excited to have him? If we are not, we'll close this class and just go. Yes, we are excited. Good evening. All right. Good evening. Ha, Mr. Femi. Yes. I'll, I'll see Miki the class captain of this class. You are always in class, yeah. and I'm glad. I'm so glad I, I came late. I know it's fine. It's fine. I am excited. Good evening. All right. Yeah, so that being said, um, I would give Dr. Zambu the floor now. So you're welcome. Please, you can have the I'm floor. Excited. Now. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me. Yes, sir, we can. All Good right. Evening, Good evening, everybody, and you're welcome to today's session. Um, I've not been with the previous ones, but uh, uh, we're going to have a uh, small discussions today, and we share. When I said we share from my world of experience, I was told that uh, we have farmers on board, we have intending farmers on board, and I believe there is possibility. There are those that are even more experienced than I am. But a brief about me before we go in, as she rightly said, my name is Dr. Sambo. I'm a veterinarian, my first degree. And then I have business administration. I have organizational leadership, plus or minus. And I'm also a practicing farmer, of course. I'm currently doing this uh, video from my farm and um, 
if time permits us, I may have to move either I will switch to my phone so that we can see some practical things that are really going on concerning the topic that we're going to be looking at today briefly, even with the short time that we have. So because of the short timing, I'm going to going to launch directly into the whole thing. And I'm sure, I'm sure all of you are aware this is being sponsored by Vet Act. And permit me to recognize the CEO, Mr. Blessing Mene. He has been a great blessing to me and our farmers in Ilorin. Yes, just for your information, I'm talking from Ilorin, Quara State. And this is where I'm based, this is where my business is, and this is where I run farm for myself and other clients that are also part of our list. So we'll be talking about climate smart poultry farm management. Climate smart poultry farm management. In the course of my presentation and discussion, please, if you have any question, even within the presentation, you can use the chat box to drop your question, or you can jot it down at the end of everything. We'll have a few minutes that will be able to exchange knowledge even concerning your questions. Now, climate smart poultry farm management. If you look at the words, it sounds so big as if it's one research topic, but I believe I'm dealing with practical farmers and my personal concepts in life is more of practicality than uh, policy, theories, research paper. Of course, we cannot do without those things. It helps us to make decisions even as we are producing. But I love and I appreciate practical approaches to issues, to problems in life, so that we can be able to elevate them, mitigate them, or reduce the effects they have on us. So as you're all aware, if you've been following the media, especially some of our Western countries, you notice there is this uh, wildfire just coming up from nowhere and then burning bushes, burning crops, displacing people from their houses. We are having IDP here as a result of insecurity, while in the Western world where we look up to, as so many are hoping to jump out to that place, they are on one of their major problems they are facing now is the issue of climate effect with wildfires, uh, tsunami, flooding, and what have you. But we're going to center on our own region here because this is where we are, this is where we do business, and this is where we're hoping to make money to be self-reliant and support our families by the grace of God. So we are talking about poultry farm management as climate affects our productivity. Now, the poultry in its own, you know, when you mentioned the word poultry, we're talking about birds, and basically what most of us do uh, I'll narrow it down to broilers and layers. Of course, we have some other forms of birds that are there, but we may not consider them today, even though they are all part of economy productivity. If we launch into them, there's every possibility that we're going to make money out of it. So the birds we're talking about, who are they, by the way? Because we need to understand these guys a little bit, you know, from... Uh, physiological and anatomical point of view. Please don't be scared. I'm not going to use any grammar that none of us will not understand. So birds generally from a physiological point of view are warm blooded animals. We need to understand that it's very, very important. And what it means to be a warm blooded an animal, it means you have a maximum, there's a temperature that exists within your body that has to be maintained for you to function normally, physiologically. What I mean by physiologically is the normal activities of the body when you eat food, you mastigate, it goes to your stomach, digestibility, your body absorb, it send it to the various part of your body where it will be utilized either for productivity, maintenance, and what have you. Then at the end of the day, the waste product is being packed up and excreted as uh, manure in terms of uh, uh, litter in terms of birds. So we are, birds are warm-blooded, and uh, that means human beings are warm-blooded too. Take note of that. So there are some few things that we have in common when it comes to that. Then they are referred to as uh, flighty feathered oviparous vertebrate. You know, they have feathers in their body, and they don't have sweat glands. It's very, very important because we're talking about climate. We're going to consider so many things about temperature, so we need to lay this foundation. 
and then they have high metabolic rate. What I mean by that is their ability to take in food, convert it, and excrete the waste is very, very high. That is why in those days, if you eat too much in the village, the grandfathers and mothers, if they want to abuse you, they will tell you that you eat like a chicken. You know, once they see it, once they sight it, believe you me, they keep taking it in and then converting it and then sending it out. So they have high metabolic rate compared to that of a human being. Then they have a normal breath, you know, breath. You know, some of you will be wondering, ah, so birds, of course, they breathe, they are living things. And for you to convert whatever food that you take in, there is a need for you to push in oxygen in, this, in, the, in order to exchange it with carbon dioxide, which is part of the waste, so that you can have a normal uh, metabolic activities. And their normal breath is 40 to 50 per minute, as in in and out, in and out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. They do between 40 to 50 times per minute. Then their normal body temperature, the normal body temperature of a bird is between 39.4 to 40 degrees centigrade, okay? While that of human being, the maximum we maintain most times is around 37. So you can notice that that of bird is about two to three degrees centigrade higher than that of human being. And they have ways in, the, in order, there the are methods and ways they physiologically adopt in order to regulate their body temperature. Apart from the one we do as farmers in order to make the environment conducive for them, they too on their own have some few uh, methods that they use in order to control their body temperature. Among them, which we may, may not go deep into it, but just for knowledge, is conductivity. You know, in physics, when you say something is conducting, it means there is a temperature attached to a higher temperature attached to a lower temperature. That which is of the lower temperature will pick part of the heat from the higher one and then either make use of it or disseminate it into the environment. We have the convection for the conventional way. We have the radiation and we have evaporation. Okay, this is just for your information. Now, narrowing down to our topic for today. Uh, please, can you share my slide? Sorry, I started talking before my slide. Can you share my slide? All right, uh, on that. Hello? Aha, uh -huh. I think we are going to launch into the slides. Uh, this is just a preamble, just a brief on who are these guys that we are dealing with, which mm. are the birds. Okay? Can everybody see? All right, let me just. Yes, yes sir. Yes, we can see. Yes, All we right. can see, sir. I hope so far so good. My audibility is okay. We can hear you clearly, sir. sir. All right. Thank okay, you. sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's go back to the... Okay, this is not my slides. Yeah, no, Don't that's that I'm on climate. Yeah. Uh, let's give yes. me a minute. Let me get to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, this is the first slide. Okay. Yeah, this is the topic as I have earlier introduced. Um, smart, the climate smart poultry farm management. Okay, so as I've mentioned in the preamble, I've given you the average body temperature of the birds. I've mentioned how birds on their own manage to, to have to manage their own temperature apart from what we do as an external uh, method in order to help them. And I said they don't have a sweat gland. Okay, and one of the easiest way they use to disseminate their body temperature, apart from those physics I mentioned, the evaporation, radiation, uh, uh, conductivity, you know, the pant is one of the easiest way that birds normally help themselves to drop their body temperature by panting. We're going to look at this as we go down our discussion. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, we are talking about uh, climate smart poultry farming. It involves integration, integrating innovative techniques and technology to mitigate the impact of poultry operations on the environment and adapt to the challenges posed by climate changes. Take note, there are techniques and technologies which we'll be looking at briefly 
in order to combat the effect of poultry farming in the environment, on the environment, and also in our economy. The primary goal is to promote efficient and profitable poultry production while minimizing greenhouse emission, okay? We are looking at a way we'll be able to maximize profit in our production and also to minimize. You see, I we didn't use the word to stop. It's a matter of minimizing now, because if you say you're going to stop uh, greenhouse gas emission, that means you have to take out all the poultry in the whole wide world so that uh, there won't be any green gas emission in the environment. So we are looking for how to uh, minimize the greenhouse uh, gas emission. Now, I have mentioned the word greenhouse uh, gas emission. For those that are, may not be familiar with it, uh, greenhouse gas is the gas that is being released to the atmosphere that tends to increase the atmospheric temperature on planets. And the planet here, it may be Earth, it may be Mars, it may be Venus, you know, the nine planets. I think they have discovered much more. I'm not a geographer, so my interest for now is planet Earth. So these are the gases that are being released into the atmosphere that has the tendency to increase the atmospheric temperature. Temperature, this is from Wikipedia, and we it has a serious effect on those breasts. Even you as a human being, it has an effect on you and enhancing overall sustainability of our poultry production that will lead us to profitability. For those of you that are into production already, I'm sure you're praying, you're looking for ways and means to survive the current trouble we are facing in the industry as a result of hike in input cost and drop in marketability. This is not our topic for consideration today, but I think by the time we are done with this, we'll find a little bit of, uh, I use the word palliative in order to see how we can incorporate this climate issue, smart climate poultry production, in order to maximize profit and combat the current uh, crisis that the poultry industry is facing. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. Now, what are the key aspects of climate smart poultry farming that uh, uh, we're going to consider? You can see from the slide, the first one is energy efficiency. As I earlier mentioned, uh, birds are very, very high in metabolic rates. Generally, they take a lot, they convert a lot, and the uh, process of breaking down feeds that they take in is, is a long process, which is not part of our discussion today. But in the process of converting those nutrients as they consume it every day, is either they maximize those energy that they convert from the feed we give them for productivity, either to produce egg or to produce meat for us. Or if there is a compromise in the general environment, they tend to emit this energy into the environment. So if you didn't provide a conducive environment for them to utilize this energy you're giving them on a daily basis, they tend to uh, emit those energy into the environment. And if you're a smart poultry farmer that is uh, climate smart conscious, you will definitely follow some of the things we're going to tell you today in order to provide the adequate environment so that the energy they are consuming from your feed, they will be able to maximize it efficiently. One of the major crises we are facing now, as you're all aware, is because of the high cost of maize, the availability and the cost of maize, which is one of the major energy components in the feed composition of our birds. Of course, it is something that if we're able to give them whatever quantity and they maximize it fully, it is going to help us economically because there will not be waste. And also, by the time they utilize it for productivity, definitely it will reduce the emission of those unused energy into the atmosphere that will not give us a climate friendly environment in order to utilize that which we are giving them. So it's, it has an economic implication. Waste management, of course, if we are climate smart conscious, we are all aware that the poultry uh feces definitely it has a uh, negative and a positive effect for those of us that are into high production you notice that once your uh, your litter is overdue 
especially those that are using deep data, uh, there is this heat on its own. It has a cap capability of dispensing heat into the environment. Seriously, you don't need to be told by the time you enter the pen and you have a good number of breaths in a deep litter and the litter is due and you have not changed it on time, you discover that there will be some biological degradability activities going on. And one of the wastes that those uh, bacteria discharge into the atmosphere is heat because they are living organism. Of course, that uh, discharge of heat and gases, we'll see how it's being utilized also for the good of the farmer. Then water con conservation, of course, uh, if you want to be a climate smart poultry farmer, uh, water is very, very important. The direct effect of uh, climate changes in our poultry farms, we, we don't need to overemphasize it, but you know that because of the climatic changing wall over, there is a depletion of uh, the hydraulic, uh, hydrological uh, deposit of our water beneath the earth. Of course, if you want to get good quality water, you know that you have to drill some meters down into the ground, on to 200 meters, depending on which location you are. And definitely as the season change within a year, during dry season, we notice mostly in our farms that are using submersive uh, boreholes, machines to uh, vertically uh, pump water up. There is always a change in the concentration of those, uh, the, the water we normally pump out during uh, dry season because the concentration is increasing and there is no dilution from the major source. Our seas are getting more saline because evaporation is taking up and the effect of our activities as, as human beings in the environment is certainly and definitely affecting uh, the water conservation. And this has a direct effect on even us as human beings, that uh, even the water we consume too uh, is being affected by such uh, a climatic change even on our water. Next slide. Climate resilient housing. Yes, it is very, very important. Some of those that are into this production on a commercial ground, some of those that have the privilege to, cons to construct our own housing, uh, definitely you know there's some basic uh, things that you need to consider when you're building your house. One of the major things which some of, some of us ignored is the orientation of the housing. Uh, the standard is east to west orientation. You know, then if you're doing deep litter poultry, uh, either uh, uh, layers or rollers, the, the system you're using, is it an open-sided housing? Are you using cage system? Are you using container system? Container system is one of the best practice of housing you can deploy in your farm, but is very, very expensive. I think where it is more common in the African region is in South Africa. But I know that some farms in in, in, in Lauren, I mean, some farms in Nigeria that have adopted this system. Of course, in such a housing system, you know that there you have uh, best of technology where your temperature is being controlled, uh, your air, your humidity, and what have you. And if you can afford it, I always uh, advise. I'm not using that one yet, but we are hoping in the future we're going to adopt it. If you have such system of housing. I can assure you the climate effects in the environment that we're having has no business with you. The only trouble you're going to have in Nigeria with such a housing system is the issue of power because some of these housing are basically uh, power uh, controlled. They need a lot of energy because there are motors that use push your conveyor belts that are uh, electricity needed to power your compressors there is a need for the blade of, uh, of the big, big fans that you're using to be powered and all this required the enormous amount of energy. So in a country where we have a serious problem with energy, uh, it's, it's going to be a serious investment, it's capital intensive, but I can tell you the, 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 the output in such housing is so, 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 so great. We're going to talk about it later in the day in our discussion. Disease management. Of course, if you are uh, you deploy a climate smart poultry farming system, uh, you're going to have a tremendous uh, advantage uh, of controlling diseases in your farm. 
Of course, even in the local uh, way, we are doing it in the open-sided uh, system. By the time you construct your poultry house and you're not conscious of uh, the, the climate, you know, the side side opens, or even if you're using the, the battery cage system, you have to be conscious of the climate when you are doing your construction. And by the time you get it right, which we're going to look at some few advantages or input that we're going to deploy, I can guarantee you your cost of antibiotics and other things will be drastically reduced. And maybe in the business aspect of this uh, presentation that you will have come through, they will have to inform you that your ability to cut down your cost is profit. So profit is not only when you sell and you make extra money on it, but if you budget your production, uh, EOP, your economic of production, and you're able to cut down costs in your medication by managing your diseases uh, outbreak, I can tell you that it's going to add positively to your uh, profit. And one unfortunate thing is if you allow disease outbreak in your farm, most of these stubborn diseases, some of them have been deposited, if not permanently in your farm and in your subsequent production, if care is not taken, you have to be battling on how to uh, reduce the effect of those uh, diseases in your farm. Then the agroforestry and land use, uh, this may not uh, be so directly with us, but in the process of maybe acquiring a new land uh, in the bushes that you want to construct your farm, you know, most of us go into the deforestation by cutting down big, big trees. And unfortunately, we do forget to replant them by the side. If your main poultry house is going to be in the center of the bush and is already a forest where there are big trees that have been there for years and you want to cut them down in order to create more space for your poultry house, please, it's very, very important when you cut them down you should replant them to some proximity to your poultry pen because with that, you're adding value to the generality of the environment and also you're helping your poultry farm to have, as you all are aware, you know, the, the, the trees take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen while we take oxygen and dispense carbon dioxide. So there is a mutual a kind of mutual agreement where you build your poultry house and it's zero uh, plant, zero trees around. I can tell you even that environment will not be conducive for you as a human being, not to talk of your bread. So it's very, very important. We should be conscious when we are using land. I would be conscious when we are putting them down in order to create space for our poultry. Next slide. Sustainable feed sourcing. Definitely, if you're into poultry production, one of the two common uh, target uh, output we are looking at is egg and meat. Of course, egg comes from layers, while meat comes from either your cockerel, broilers, noilies, and what have you. So if you are climate sensitive when it comes to your poultry farm production, I can tell you that you have a guarantee of getting the best of eggs and meat production, which is going to sustain your economical viability and also it's going to serve as a means of food security in a nation like Nigeria that we have. Precision farming. Uh, I'm also into crop production because uh, um, having an averagely a uh, good number of brawlers. I'm purely into brawlers production, but uh, I also go into crop production, especially now that uh, uh, one of the major component of the feed is maize, and it's maize that is indirectly determining uh, our cost of production now. Of course, there are issues of uh, subsidy, economic devaluation of an era, all these things, but I personally went into crop production so that I'll be able to uh, mitigate or rather cut down the cost of my production in the future. I want to start producing my own feed. So what I do in my crop production farming is I do specific precision farming. What I mean by that, just to protest the, portray the meaning of precision farming, is I do calculated farming in the sense that I do soil tests before uh, knowing what to plant, send it to specialists, that is their field. They analyze the data, they send me results. I will forward 
the results to a seed specialist where he will advise me precisely the kind of seed that is going to be good for such uh, land use, the fertilizer I need to use and what have you. And based on the research data of a particular seed I'm going to plant, I already know that I'm going to get so, so, so tons of maize after production because I'm doing calculative uh, production. The same thing in poultry farming. I'm going to talk about my own section, which is the broilers. I always know from beginning, which I will advise if you're not practicing this, please always know before you bring in a single broiler chicken to your farm, you need to understand what you want to produce. Are you targeting two kilo life weight? Are you targeting three kilo life weight? Are you targeting uh, 1.8 dress weight? What amount of feed do you need to give them in order to attain such weight? All these data, you need to have them at hand. And one of the things I will also advise, which I practice in my farm as a policy, is before I stock, before my birds came into my farm, what I do is I will ensure all the required feed and medications are in store. Of course, for broilers production, you don't need to keep them maximum of eight weeks, depending on what you're targeting. But for layers, which you cannot keep your feed in your store for more than one year, that one is different. But you can do precision calculation if you have to keep them, you want to be Uh, I guess is can you hear me? Can anyone hear me, please? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. I think his network went off. Uh, okay. let's just, let's just my event back. But have we been enjoying the class so far, please? Yes, ma, we have. Right. Very interesting. Yes, right. yes, ma. Thank you. Let's just you can hear you, ma. All right, let's just hold on a bit while you try to reconnect. Please don't leave the class because so that you don't miss too much. Like I said, if you are not in this class, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. <laughs> I, that's just to joke around. Too. Mm. Hello. All right, welcome back, sir. Oh. Welcome back. Together. Welcome back. Right. Welcome. Sorry, we are together. Sorry, I think it's a network failure from my own end. Yeah, we thought as much too. We thought as much, but that's fine. Sorry about that. Uh... That's fine, sir. So, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Yes, let's continue. Yeah, so what I'm, where I think I thought of is the issue of precision, exactly. So you need to be uh, uh, target sensitive, you know, uh, uh, as I was advising, uh, one of the best uh, methods you can deploy if you can afford it, especially when you're into broilers production is to make sure you have the calculated number of feed and drugs you need for each production so that you have them in store. Of course, most of the feed being produced by our commercial feed millers have a lifespan of at least six months. And I don't see where you can keep your feed for six months when you're doing rollers. And for layers, my advice is you calculate it based on uh, maybe two, two monthly needful uh, feed so that this issue of uh, uncontrollable uh, input increase, especially in feed, you'll be able to mitigate it. Uh, I'm having 7,000 rollers on ground now. They're exactly uh, four weeks yesterday. Of course, uh, we are able to attend almost uh, 1.6 kilo life weight, but all the feet that they need, of course, from day one, we have it in stock. 
by to the glory of God. So the increase on feed that has been going on is not directly affecting us one way or the other. So that is just by the way. And uh, the, the next one is uh, emission reduction. Of course, if you adopt a climate smart poultry production system, you'll be able to reduce emission into the environment. As small as 50 birds that you have in your backyard, you may think 50 is just an ignorable number, but I can tell you, if you're able to capture the amount of uh, carbon dioxide these guys are emitting into the environment, not to talk of the ammonia coming from their litter, I can tell you it has a very, very serious adverse effect, even in the immediate environment that you're living in, not to talk of the overall effect it has on the generality of climate, which all of us are living in. Uh, next slide. Now we're going to look at uh, understanding the impact of climate uh, changes in our poultry farming. Climate influences various aspects of poultry farming. Of course, you can agree with me from birth health and behavior to housing requirements and resource management. What this means is, of course, if there is an increase in temperature, some of us knew this. is very well the water you have to look for means of uh, dosing them with maybe vitamin c you have to if you didn't plan your housing very well definitely at that period you may have to find a way of increasing your ventilation uh, in in the in the poultry house so it has an adverse effect on your bird's health. And if you didn't plan for it, of course, it's going to affect your resources because if it suddenly happened and you have not uh, uh, predict such happenings and you do not consult any expert when you're constructing your housing, that is when you start losing money, you have to sleep less night and God forbid, it even affects your health as a human being because where your money is, there your heart is, you know, as the scripture says by the way. So it has an adverse effect even on you as a person. It is also vital to, en to ensuring the well-being and productivity of poultry folks. Okay, Climate plays a significant role in shaping the environment in which poultry farm operates. And being aware of its effects allow farmers to implement climate smart practices to mitigate potential challenges. As I said, definitely if you prepare against some of these effects, some of these adverse effects that are happening. If you're living in an environment where there's no record of flood, there's no record of uh, adverse increase in temperature, what I will still advise you is please follow the standard. Climate change is not controlled by human beings, even though it is being uh, caused by human activities and some other activities which is created by human beings, we cannot control it per se, climatically, that's in the global level. So you need to prepare ahead of time in terms of constructing your house, controlling, I mean, con constructing the house of your birds and other things we'll look at later, even the breed of your birds, the feed of your birds, all these things matters. You have to be climatically uh, 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 understandable on what is happening in your environment so that you can be able to factor some of these challenges so that when they arises, you already have a mitigating uh, capacity so that it do not affect your productivity. Next slide. We're going to look at the uh, key areas where climate impacts our poultry farming. There are a key, few key areas that we picked, we're going to discuss about uh, temperature stress. Of course, we have mentioned uh, key areas where climate impact poultry farming. That's the next slide. Yes, after this one, exactly, this is it. Um, temperature stress, uh, this is a, as should I say, non-pathogenic causes of mortality in poultry farming. Mind you, I said non-pathogenic. What I mean by non-pathogenic is it has no bacterial, viral, fungal, or organic influence. It happens because there is extreme temperature and it's not just heat, but even cool, even extreme cool temperature can cause 
hit stress in our brain. Of course, especially during the brooding period, we all know that you have to maintain a temperature of above 30 degrees centigrade throughout your brooding period, especially the first seven days. Meanwhile, if you deny them of that temperature, when the temperature drop below 20 degrees, I can assure you that your birds will be affected throughout their lifespan. So it's not just the heat, it's not just extreme uh, heat, but even extreme cold do affect your bread. And the result of this is they will have undernutrition because instead of the birds eating and converting the feed for their either to give you good eggs or to give you bo good body weight, they tend to use the energy in panting. Remember in the introduction, I said they don't have a sweat gland. So what they do is through air, they pant. They release the heat through their air system in order to cool down the temperature. And that requires a lot of energy. So if there is extreme heat in your bird's house, that is a consequence of undernutrition. And this can result to stunted growth, reduction in egg production and even the excise. The same thing with the cold. You know, if you didn't provide them external uh, temperature heat that will maintain what they need, they will be converting the energy in their body to heat up the internal organs in order to avoid uh, losses. And this can also result to sudden death. You know, there's a syndrome they call sudden death syndrome. Uh, sometimes, especially in layers, when there are, oh, the brawlers specifically too, both of them, once there is an accumulated uh, amount of fat in the body, and there is a sudden increase in temperature. You know, it has an adverse direct effect on the physiology. Like even the fat, literally, the fat in the body will start melting. And you can imagine if a, a, a fat in your body is being melted, uh, is not in a normal physiological way, but in a pathological way, definitely it's going to increase stress on your body organs. And the only way the body organ can survive is to shut down. And once there is a shutting down of your vital organs, even as a human being, you know that definitely the brain cannot work and it will result to sudden death. Then disease can spread easily. Climate can influence prevalence and transmission of poultry diseases. Uh, those of you that are familiar with coccidiosis, let me use that uh, typical disease. You know, during the rainy season, like here, this is August, we are experiencing serious rain here. It is very, very easy for deep litter to experience moisture. And moisture, once the litter is due, you do not change it on time, it tends to attract moisture and it converts your sodas or whatever bedding you're using faster than during the dry season. And that, of course, you know, the oocyst of uh, the coccidio uh, disease, of course, the bacteria tends to hatch fast and they begin to affect your breath. And we know that uh, coccidiosis is a controllable disease, but it can cost you a lot of economical loss if ignored. Then ventilation and air quality. Of course, as I earlier said, the kind of housing system you are going to adopt, is it going to be an open-sided? Is it going to be a battery cage? Or is it going to be the container system? If you're using the container system, definitely this will not affect you. But even in the container system, last year there is a viral picture of about 40,000 brawlers in South Africa going around dead, 100% mortality. And that was caused as a result of light fluctuation, I think, just for an hour or two. Mind you, if they're inside a container, it's complete blockage of air from outside to inside. So if the machines, if the ventilators are not working, even a human being in that container is going to suffocate. Not to talk to about birds. Of course, I learned he press charges and what have you, but that is on their own. So that's to show you the, 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 the quality of your air and ventilation system. Even in the a manual poultry housing that we are operating in Nigeria has a serious effect on your poultry farming. Water availability, climate affect water availability and access to clean, sufficient water is cr critical for the well-being of your poultry. Uh, you know, uh, during the dry season, if you experience it, I mentioned it earlier, because of the climatic changes we are having, the water quality, even in a submersive pump, has tends to have a high concentration because there is no dilution from the main source coming from either the rivers, the lakes, the groundwater, and what have you. So if you don't monitor 
your pH you don't monitor the concentration of your water, definitely at the end of the day, is going to have a serious uh, effect on your breast. And once they don't have clean water to drink, that is going to be a serious issue. And it's very, very important to underline this statement. Any water you cannot drink as a human being, please don't give it to your birds. Any water you as a human being, either as a result of the temperature, the quality, the hardness, the acidity, the alkalinity, whatever, whatever influence, whatever external influence that water is having from your external environment. If you as a human being cannot consume it, please don't say they are just breasts, they are just chicken, they are just animals. Let me just give them that which, and that also applies to your other livestock. Every other thing that you cannot consume, please don't give it to your bread. Underline that statement. Next slide. We are still considering key areas where climate impact poultry farming. Next slide, please. Are we together? Yes, uh, it's on the next slide. Hello. Yes, we are. Yes, it's on the next slide. Anyway, we are. We go. Eat quality. We love Climate. So, float. Yield, ability of, and we all that most of our England. Next slide. Are we together? So I just cut off and came back. Ah uh, yes, I think my yeah, network. Yeah. Is yeah. My network all right. Is, I'm back now. All right. Yes. Yeah. So once there is a, a climate related factors such as drought and flood, just like uh, we are experiencing right now in the north, the flood, apart from insecurity, we know that flood farms have been flooded and that's, that definitely is going to affect the output of the next maize and soya beans that is going to come out, which uh, the poultry industry is one of the major consumers. So if we don't do uh, climate uh, sensitive, climate smart farming, we are indirectly causing problems for ourselves because at the end of the day, it will reduce the quality of, I mean, the, the quantity of output of our crop farms and it will increase the cost of the feed. I mean, the cost of those uh, ingredients that we need to produce our feed. So at the end of the day, we are the ones being affected directly. So it is very, very important that we should be climate sensitive when it comes to our, our productivity. Then the quality of feed also, as I said, some of us are using container, iron container to store our feed. We know that in a high temperate region, those iron uh, containers conduct heat. And ignorably, some of us don't look at it. You know, as the temperature is high, it tends to overheat the container. Those feed have some uh, standard temperature because there are some micronutrients like your uh, lacin, methionine, and what that is very, very essential in your uh, feed uh, conversion capacity of your breast. Once the temperature is too high, they tend to denature some of those micronutrients. And at the end of the day, you just be feeding them carbon hydrate and the expected weight gain will not be there. So it is very important we should be aware of this environmental stress. Severe weather events such as heavy rainfall can damage poultry loss. Uh, I'm a view of this uh, in my 2000 capacity farm in Ilorin here in a in an urban settlement. Uh, we bought uh, a, a like I won't call it a river some years back, and we fill it up because we are also doing fish. So we took advantage of that to also build a small poultry house which contain about 3,000. And we've been using it for almost four years on to last year. You know, this climate of a thing, as I said, is not being controlled by human beings, even though we are the cause of most of it. Uh, from nowhere, 
uh, we have uh, birds that we are brooding that are just three days old during the rainy season from nowhere. I'm telling you, water started gushing out from the floor of the poultry house. You can imagine that kind of a mess. Water just gushing out from the floor, filling up the poultry house in the middle of the night during a heavy downfall. This is in my own farm. Of course, you can imagine the effects, number one, on the birds, which uh, we inquired some, we were able, we got some losses. Number two, it happened on a, on a Saturday night. On Sunday, I have to deploy about 50 laborers. But in fact, we spent more than a million that day on plant. Of course, we have to borrow it because it's not in our budget to do another German flow on top of that one. Then we have to move those birds to another building that is meant for uh, uh, the smoked fish production. We have to clear some of the equipment there, put them there. Of course, the house is not meant for brooding. It's not meant for birds. The additional stress we are exposing them to, but after like uh, five days, after doing the German flow, the place dried up and we have to move them. So it is something I've personally experienced. This is environmental stress as a result of severe weather even unpredictable, unplanned for. But the value of those birds, 3,000 of them, of course, compared to what we spent, even though on a loan with interest, I think it is better, but it cost us stress psychologically. Of course, we must sleep for almost three days at a stretch because me and my staff have to be there through the night, monitoring, guiding, checking, and what have you. It's not a pleasant experience, and it's not something I wish even for my enemy. So it is a terrible thing to experience. Egg production and hatchability, longer daylight boost egg output. Those of you that are into layer production, you know that one, while shorter light reduce it. Extreme temperature also impact egg hatchability. You know, if the temperature is too high, that's another thing for some of us that are doing brooding to take note. When you said you need heat for brooding, it doesn't mean you should just give them heat without control. Please, it's very, very important that you should follow the standard requirement. I'm going to give us a small data later on each week, what is expected of a bird, uh, of a particular temperature that you need to maintain them at. So if you give them temperature above requirement, even at brooding stage, it's make them lose water from their body. Definitely we dry them up. And as I said, instead of them concentrating on eating to give you weight, they will be using that energy to control their temperature. So it affects hatchability, it affects their growth, it affects your egg production. Of course, those that have layers knew that during heat period, there are so many effects on your birds. They will suddenly drop in egg production. If you're not able to manage the temperature, their water with uh, recommended medication and the feed, very, very important. There is a need to control feed during uh, heat season. There is a need to control feed during cool season. It's only in Nigeria that our commercial feed millers only produce the same kind of feed throughout the year. It is wrong. I pray one day we're going to have a regulatory body that's supposed to put those people in check. With our nutrition is spread all over the country. There is a need to change the formulation based on the weather and the period. The quantity of the amount of energy needed during the heat season is different from the amount of energy the birds will need during cool season. And the commercial producers don't care about that. They will give you the same formula from their feed meal from beginning of the season to the end. The next one was a seasonal, seasonal pattern. Seasonal changes can influence poultry behavior, feeding pattern, and overall management practice on the farm. Of course, I've mentioned it that uh, uh, even their feeding pattern definitely will change based on the season. That is why it is recommended you, there is what we call feed withdrawal, the feed withdrawal system that you need to adopt because of uh, a climatic change, because of season. Sometimes we feed them only during the cool hours of the day. That means from maybe 11 a.m. to like 4 p.m., you withdraw your feed. But if you're doing a commercial quantity, maybe you're having uh, 10,000 rollers or layers in a deep litter, 
or you're not using an automated feeder, you know, it may be difficult, but even that one, there's a system you can adopt by doing precision farming, knowing the quantity of feed, you know, that they consume in a day, you can withdraw it maybe from night so that the remnant will be used till early hours of the morning. Once they empty their uh, feeding trough, of course, you know, feed until four or 6 p.m. in the evening where the temperature has dropped. Next slide. Now we're going to be considering strategies to effectively manage the impact of climate on poultry farm. Okay, first one we say you need to implement climate controlled housing to regulate temperature and humidity. Okay, one of the best, which is very expensive as I said, is the container system. Uh, last year, a company that is producing such container contacted us in China. Uh, uh, the farm I'm presently talking from, we have 5,000 capacity of growlers because they are in stock. Um, the same space that we use for our 5,000, we're going to look at uh, housing later. The same space we use for our 5,000, when they ask me to send them the dimension and they now uh, 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 designed a container on the same site, the same size, believe you me, the number of birds that will be contained in that container on the same size that I'm using my battery cage is 10,880 birds. In the same capacity that I'm using a deep liter now that contains maximum of 5,000. But using that container from their dimensional advice that they sent to me, the diagram, he said it can take up to 10,880 birds. That is all more than two times of what I'm doing on the same space. These are the advantages of using a climate control housing system. Of course, as of that time, without clearing costs, now that the dollar has even gone beyond our height, it's about 11 million to ship it to the country, excluding clearing, of course. By the time you put that, I'm sure it's going to hit like 20 million, of course. But is, this is a capital intensive project. When you invest, I'm sure if we have the money, we can still go ahead and do it because it's going to give you advantage very, very serious advantage over the open-sided system that we are using in Nigeria. But the bottleneck, as I mentioned earlier, is energy. It requires energy usage. There are big, big motors that have some high KVA consumption. I only advise them that, see, look for a solar system uh, friendly type. But I'm just imagining if you have a 20 KVA motor conveyor belt that will move your feet, what, how many panels of the solar uh, panel will you buy in order to power just one conveyor belt is about 20 kVA. So, uh, you know, that means if you even want to use a generator, you cannot use less than 100 kVA generator to power the whole house. So that is just by the way. But even in our own local way of having a open sided uh, a poultry house, we can still do so many things when it comes to the housing. As I've been emphasizing it, open sided, open sided, of course, maximum of two blocks, then the rest should just be an open-sided, uh, uh, either you use what they call Boko Haram nets by the side in order to prevent rodent and what have you. Then the dimension of the housing. Mostly, I personally advise clients when they are using their you know, length and breadth, I always advise that the breadth should not be more than 50 feet, 30 to 50 feet. Of course, some people will tell you that 40 feet is a standard, but I would recommend 30 to 50 feet. Then the other side, the length, you can go as much as you can go based on the number of birds and the space that you need. Take note uh, for broilers, because they are deep litter, uh, one of the recommended sizes you can use is a space of 1.2 square feet per bird. 1.2 square feet per bird. So you can do the calculation yourself to see how you'll be able to get the accurate sizes. Then the dimension of the housing, it also matters a lot in order to control the climatic changes that affect our poultry houses. What I mean by that is the length and the breadth. That is what we call east-west dimension. The length should be facing north and south, while the breadth should be facing east and west. From your little geography, you will understand what I mean by that because the sun rises from the east and goes down to the west. So by the time the sun centered on the top, it will have a, you know, the, the sun ray coming, coming into your housing, 
you know, sometimes if you look at those that have wrong dimension, the, it tends to push the breast to one side, especially when you're using north-south dimension, because the sun will be directly uh, exposed into your housing. So the best way to mitigate this thing is when you're doing your housing, you should be conscious of the east-west dimension where the length will be at your north west, I mean, north south, while the breadth will be at east west, where the sun rises and the sun goes down so that it will not be coming in by the side. But it, even if it's going to be coming in, it just be a little exposure into the poultry house. Or else you see them running away from the sun, they will just be crowding in one side. If the sun is going down, they will now run to the other side and that is not going to be too good for your production. Plan for seasonal changes in feed consumption and adjust feed ration. So like my time is really going, so I'm going to be rushing. Uh, what I mean, as I mentioned earlier, some of those things I've been mentioning them, that do, there is a need to formulate feed based on season. Of course, during the heat period, there is a amount of energy you need to use and our feed, commercial feed millers in Nigeria are not doing that. And also your ration, as I said, the time for feeding, you need to know when to feed them and when to withdraw your feed. Ensure access to clean and sufficient water throughout the year. The water you cannot drink, please don't give it to your bread. So there is a need for you to continuously do your pH test and also measure the temperature. For those of you that have overhead tank outside the poultry house, please try and get a cover for that tank because those black, black sorex tank, you know, black attracts heat from the sun. So you'll be cooking the water and you'll be serving them tea. I don't think birds are interested in coffee. I don't think they have interest in taking tea or coffee from you because their normal body temperature is 39 plus already. So I don't see where you can serve them tea as source of water. Provide adequate ventilation to ensure good air inside the poultry house. Of course, we've mentioned that you shade or cooling system during hot weather to reduce heat stress in bread, of course. Uh, the, the system of the housing, especially in the roof, you know, at the top of the roof, we always know that there is this uh, V-shaped roof on top of the normal roof where there will be air passage under it because the air density, you know, it goes, it, 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 it uses a normal physics uh, where it moves from an area of high concentration to a lower concentration. So the heat is being built up from the data down. So the air up is always cooler. There is a tendency of the hot air that is lighter because it has been heated to go up. And as it goes up, it tends to push the cooler one down. And if you have that ventilation system up on top of your roof, it tends to dissipate the heat from the top, okay? Monitor weather forecast and prepare for extreme weather event to protect poultry and infrastructure. Now, this is the cooling school season, or rather this is raining season, and we are heading toward cool season towards December, maybe November, December, January, as the climate is even affecting the natural temperature. So you need to know. And one thing I want to advise you is, please, if you're into broiler production, you need to understand the characteristics of your bread. Aboika has uh, characteristics. COP500 has its own characteristics. Marshall has its own characteristics and other ones. So. Some of them are heat tolerant, some of them are zero heat tolerant. Like personally, I'm using a COP500. COP500 is heat tolerant, okay? So a boy car is not heat tolerant. By the time they hit six weeks, seven weeks in your pain and the temperature is very, very high, if you're not able to mitigate or create a better temperature in the environment for them, you may end up picking high, high mortality. Just like that, they'll just be dying. Okay, but uh, 500, I'm not demarketing any hatchery, please take note, but this is for your commercial production uh, uh, advantages. So if we're able to consider some of these above or some other things that we don't have, we don't have the time to discuss for now, I believe if we adopt this in our farms, the little I've said so far, I can guarantee you that you're going to have a better production and you're going to have a good environmental friendly uh, poultry farm to yourself and to your birds where they will grow peacefully, convert your feed very well and then take advantage of your, uh, your production and you make more money. Thank you and God bless.
So this season is over. This session is over for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Ah, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sambu. That was amazing. That was a very good one. Thank, thank you for time very... for your time, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Time, sir. We are very, very God bless you for that. So please, um, do you have any question? Um questions, questions. This is the time to take it now. Questions, please. I have a little question, please. All right, no. please go. Uh, any question? Yes, yeah, someone was about to ask a question. I don't know what it is now. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, please, you are. All right. Uh, you mentioned uh, the dimension of um, the pen, as in the dimension, the Angular shape with side will face the sun or something like that. Can you buttress on that again, sir, please? Okay, thank you. What I mean is, um, okay, I will attempt to step outside for you to see uh, uh, maybe what I'm talking about. Uh, am I permitted to do that? Ah, uh, yes, please. You can. You can, please. Thank okay. you, sir. My, my, my internet will carry me. Okay. Um, can you hear me all? Yeah, I hear you. We can hear you, sir. Okay. This is. Uh, I don't know if you can see the poultry house clearly. Uh, this is slow. Oh, yeah. You can see that very well. Yes, yeah, in the sky. Okay. Okay. Can you see it now? Okay, we can see from the. Yeah. Yes, see you it. can see the length. Yeah. Okay. You can see the length. Now you can see the sun coming down. Did you mm. see? Yes. So it, it's facing. Yes, you can see. Uh -huh. So it's facing the breadth, not the length. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, I understand. The sun is setting down now. It's only facing the breadth part of the poultry house, not the length. So imagine the sun is on this is on this direction here. The ray will definitely occupy the whole length. Automatically, all the birds will run away to the other side. Mm. But as of this dimension, it is just a portion of the breadth, just a few percentage that the rays is coming in. So that's what I mean. Thank you that's very much. What I mean by understood. That. I hope you're clear. Yes. Yes. Any other question? Yes, sir. Uh, there was a question in the chat box. It says, please, sir, uh, at what week should I um at what week can I withdraw it from my chicken pens? From my chicks' pen. Oh, beautiful. That's brooding now. Yes, um I will use my practical standard. I always tell people some of the things I do is not in the books, but uh years of years of practice. What I do is for seven days. Meanwhile, there is these five senses I advise my clients to use. Your eyes that you see, your nose that you smell, your tongue that you taste, your air, this one that you hear, then your touch. So if you deploy these five senses into your poultry production, sometimes even at three days, you withdraw the heat. So don't follow the books. Follow the reality on ground. Because this is raining season, I do seven days. During extreme temperature, nature helps me to do brooding. Sometimes it's only in the night I just put heat a little bit towards the early hours of the morning. Sometimes three, four days I withdraw the heat. So there is no standard period. And another thing I would recommend is this. This is a temperature humidity uh, machine, very small and tiny. I think the last time I bought it is around 18,000. Please, if you want to get profit in your business, try to invest in some of these small, small, small instruments. This uh, machine measures humidity and temperature in your poultry house. So if you know the standard that you're supposed to use within a particular period, Every day you go in there in the morning, in the evening, in the afternoon, look at the temperature that this machine is giving you a feedback 
then the reality in their behavior will also tell you that, ah, they need heat, oh. no, the heat is too much. Oh. Of course, we all know that by the time they are running away from the source of heat, that means the heat is too much. By the time they are uh, coddling each other, which definitely result to mortality most times, especially during brooding, you know that the heat is not enough. So I will not tell you uh, withdraw after two, three days, but maximum of seven days, then deploy your five senses into your poultry production. I don't know if I make sense in that. Yes, it did, sir. It did. Thank you. Uh, we have other questions in the chat box. Um, someone says, with my water tank outside, can you elaborate on how to keep it cool? Yes, very fast. Um, you use a shade. Put a shade. Oh, you know what I mean by shade is roof it. Okay? Use a roof on top of the overhead tank. Oh, get, um, there is this uh, sap that they normally use to transport cashew. I don't know what they call it uh, in English, but it's just like a cloth, it's like a clothing, you know, it has a way of keeping water on it. You can cover your tank with it and you need to be waiting it from time to time. But uh, sometimes people are not interested in using white tank because it gets dirty easily. But what I'm telling you is the dirt you're seeing in a white tank is the same dirt in that your black tank, unfortunately, you cannot see. So it's even better to have a white tank that when it is filled up with spirogyra and other things, you will be able to clean it. So you can use white tank and use a cover on it. Because we are doing commercial production, we have two tanks. We have the black one outside and a white one inside. The one, one inside is for medication. So it's either we direct the water directly into the, okay, we're using automatic uh, water drinker too. So it either come directly from the overhead tank outside or if we are doing medication, it comes into the white tank and then dispense to the drinkers. Or during heat period, we have to push it into the white tank inside the house for like one hour or two, then we now release it to them. So there are so many other mechanisms that you can deploy based on the quantity you have, but invest in your poultry house so that you can make money and save losses. Right, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Um, also, please, can you explain more on the best species? Is this best species? I don't know. Okay, breed, breed of birds. You use that those is as... <laughs> they... okay, yeah, that is an entirely different uh, subject. But in in a brief, I mentioned COP five hundred which I said for 500, uh, I don't want to call any hatchery name because uh, they will not give vet act any compensation for advertisement, so I'm not going to mm. do that. Uh, you look for the hatchery in Nigeria that produce COP 500, you're on your own on that one. They are heat resistance. It's one of the best breeds you can use when the temperature is very high. Their only trouble is during brooding, that is why people are running away from it. During brooding, you have to maintain that temperature too. A slight drop in temperature less than 30 degrees will cause mortality. But if we're able to cross that uh, brooding period, I can tell you they are having a high feed conversion ratio and they resist heat. While a boika, this is their period, this is their time, rainy season, once they get four or five weeks, the fat is accumulated, the weather on its own is a bit cold. Unfortunately, even during this rainy season, there are days we record high temperature. That is why we're talking about climatic changes now there are days that the weather will just on its own shoot up. You know, you can't control it. So it's depending on your housing system, the age of your birth, the breed of your age, the, the, the breed of your birth, and the kind of feed that you're using too, that also has a lot of effects, your kind of feed. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, sir. Um, okay. Okay, we have another one. What are the ratio? What are the ration of energy ration. needed? Ration of energy needed during the cool and dry season. Uh, I'm not a nutritionist, as right. I complained earlier. Okay, as I complained earlier, our feed millers, our commercial feed producers, are expected to be the ones to do the needful. I cannot give you the calories needed specifically 
I have not invested time to do that. I have not started producing my own feed, but I know by the time I launch my own personal feed meal, I must be equipped with some of this information. So I have not ventured into the research on that one, but I know that uh, during heat period, the calories are lower, while during cool season, uh, the calories are higher. But that is the speciality of a feed nutritionist. You will be in a better position to advise that. Maybe mm -hmm. by next year, we can advise you properly. But for now, we have not uh, done any research on that. But advisably, that's the best thing. Since our commercial feed millers cannot help us with that, what we do is we withdraw feed to survive. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. We are so glad. Um, I saw Mr. Musa's hand up. Do you want to say something? Yes, thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you for organizing this educative session. And I also want to appreciate uh, the presenter, who is my direct voice and a mentor for this uh, uh, presentation. <laughs> so I just want to request from the organizers, if um, this um, session, I, I can see that it's recorded, you can just share it with uh, the participants, including myself, so that we can benefit continuously from it. Okay, yes. Yeah. So for every live session we have, it is always um, recorded and the link to watch again is always made available. So you get it. You definitely get the link to watch again. All right. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you will raise the, please you can speak up. You are raising your hand. Okay. Um, thank you, sir, for this uh, for this lecture. It was really educative. Um, so on the issues of dimensions of a good pen, I think that was where most people are most interested because we have created as we have built a pen one way or the other, being a small pen or a large pen. Personally, I I constructed a a pen for myself early this year, and uh, I can say your dimensions that you gave the bread that's to fifty feet. I was in range, the length is as long as number of beds, but there's a particular dimension you did not mention, the height. The height, as you mentioned the roof, but I think I did not get the height, or maybe you did. And then also, sir, on the issue of, of um, afforestation, maybe you get to a place and you cut down the trees. I I am currently in a place where I don't have any trees. So I am I wanted to know, can I, uh, maybe plant uh, plantain, but it grows faster because if I act, if I want to plant trees, it take a longer time. Can I, can I plant plantain? Is plantain uh, plantation a good shade in my poultry pen? Thank you, sir. Yes. Um. Let me take the first one. Yeah. Um. The dimension I'm giving, I was giving you the I don't know the picture the the video the real life uh, uh, video I just showed you. Uh, the the roof, you know, apart from the normal roof coming together, they don't close. There is a space left. There is a space of about about four feet between the two roofs coming together, being left open. Then on top of it, you do another rafter that is close and it's just short to cover the opening. But there will be a space, a ventilated space where if the heat comes from under, it may be able to go out through that space that is left open, you understand? And the length, mostly the first uh, open-sided, most people use eight, some people use 12 feet, okay? Depending on your region, in the north, they may use up to 12. In the south, uh, let's say now, this is the south southwest, they use maybe around eight. You know, the temperature is not the same on the regional location, but that is the standard on the roof. That thing, that ventilation is, uh, that vent, let me use the word vent, that vent is very, very, very important because the heat normally comes, it doesn't dissipate by the side because the air is supposed to come by the side, push it up based on radiation, then the heat goes up and get disseminated from the top. The side opening brings in fresh air, then the top, release your heat. And even the top need to be netted because that can be a medium for rodent, breads, and what are you to enter. Then the issue of the afforestation, okay? Make sure you don't use, of course, plantain. Then the distance from the pen, you don't put it close by the pen. At least give it minimum of, let's say, 
10 feet away from your pen. You can pull it around and make sure you don't plant trees that will allow birds, other external birds to create their housing there. As you know, those birds are vectors, they carry diseases here and there, and they may end up affecting your bird. So don't plant trees that will create housing for other birds. Then the distance so that there will be free flow of air from the tree to the pen, and there will be complete uh, exchange of the airflow between the trees, which will give you good ventilation, create more oxygen in your environment, and then the birds too will be happier. And of course, you're creating more diluted uh, oxygen in the environment. Then if you can afford it, maybe during the rainy season, allow a trim grass uh, layers. Please let there be grasses around, but trim, take note, trim so that it will not house rodents, snakes, and some other uh, reptiles that will be consuming your bread or notice. So that's that. All right, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, whose hand is up? Additional Lukman, please. You can, you can unmute. Yeah, good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Yeah, thank you for the beautiful lecture given, sir. I want you to quickly and briefly say something on marketing, as that has always been most of the challenges we upcoming farmers are having. Quickly, briefly, say something about that, sir. Mm. You see, in a sentence, in a sentence, if you can put it down, do know the end from the beginning. Always know your end from the beginning. You've seen my poultry pen that house 5,000. Maybe I decided to change a car this year change another car next year, which is a foolish business uh, thinking. And you're my neighbor. And people are telling you, Dr. Sambo is doing poultry. You decided to go and borrow money or sell your land or whatever means you're going to get and venture into poultry business without knowing the end. And this is, apart from the issue of uh, subsidy uh, feed increase that is as a result of maize, Another major problem that is affecting the business now is because people just rush into the businesses. When they get stock, they sell it at any high prices. Some of us that are commercial producers get stock because we cannot sell it at any high prices. We have facilities that we are managing and giving attention to. So before you venture in, please make sure you have a market. If you're not doing seasonal production, that you know plus or minus during Christmas salary period. If you're doing brolas, you sell it uh, plus or minus. Uh, if your stock is not much, you produce your egg. You know that somehow, somehow your neighbors, your school, or somewhere, somehow you have somewhere to put these things after production because it will be a complete waste after effort, labor, and everything. At the end of the day, you don't have market to send this in. Market affected me this year seriously. I don't want to go into that story but we are surviving it. Of course, it's a general thing. So my advice to you, try to know the end from the beginning, please. Mm. Thank you very much once again, Dr. Sambu. Thank you very much. Um, this is quite insightful training and we are glad and excited to have you here with us. Thank you Thank very you for much. Having you. Yes, sir. We believe yeah. that next time when we say you should come and help us with this, we believe you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, I, I love sharing information, especially to colleagues, farmers, you know, we're all into this together. The world is big enough to accommodate all of us. So Yes, definitely. definitely. Thank you yes. very much, sir, once again. Uh, Ube, Ube Rize, you've spoken before, so I'm sorry your hand is raised. I would not let you. I'm so sorry, but you will not be able to talk now. Um, Okori, please, Um, you can just, in one or two minutes, you can say what you want to say. You can unmute and say what you want to say, please. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Doc, thank you so much for this insight you've given to, to us. It is a great one. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, well, what I want to ask is um, one of the major uh, discomforting issues in poultry production is the, the smell that oozes out 
not for us that are farmers, but for our customers that come around. So what can be used to minimize the smell? Thank you. Yes. Um, if you are uh, in Lorraine, I will have invited you to my farm. If you did not see the building from outside the gate, you can swear that it's not chicken in my compound. My other farm is at the back of my house, the 3,000 capacity. We have, have the same birth, age, the same age of uh, four weeks there right now. I can assure you, if you're passing by my gate, if you didn't see the building or the signboard, you can sway that is no chicken there. Now, how do we achieve it? I'm using Buffy, I mean, I'm using deep litter because I'm basically into broilers. Of course, one of the major challenges is the, is the layers. But even for the layers, or let me just emphasize on the broiler because I've been to broiler farms that from a distance, you will know that there is something wrong in that place. Number one, your beddings. I mentioned it earlier, that like this training season. They are just four weeks old. And I can tell you I've changed the bedding more than four times so far. Don't forget the wood shavings we are using. We buy it at a cost. That 25 kg feedback in Ilorin now, I think it's about uh, 300 Naira. No, it's 600 Naira now. And you have to book ahead of time. That's why I was mentioning, please invest in this business. If you mean business, you have to do business. So we have changed like four times now. And during the dry season, in the whole production, it may not be more than once or twice. So you see the, 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 the issue there. So it is up to the farmer, your ability, your capacity to change as soon as you sense that smell. Don't forget the five senses I mentioned. Your nose should do the work for you. Even you, you should know that, see, something is not right here. Or by the texture, by looking at it, by touching it with your own hand, you know, while those that are doing bad free cage, okay, there is always a system of building the house with a slanting position that you can open uh, water from the other end that is upward, the water will automatically flush through and then there is a pit that it normally deposited into. Now with the issue, in fact, I skipped that part, I forgot to discuss it, the issue of biogas, which is becoming a trending uh, thing now. You can use those deposits in those pits of those feces to generate electricity and your cooking gas. That is another ball game on its own. Okay, because we are talking about climate, that is very important. Those uh, litter from your poultry house, both layers and broilers, you can use it to generate energy in your house, cooking gas in your wife's kitchen. I'm telling you, it's still a recyclable. Uh, uh, produce. So you change your litter on time and flush your battery cage uh, litter on time. That will prevent it. Then the feed millers, if you're the one doing your feed, there are some other uh, minerals that you can join, you can use into your, I forgot the name they call it, but I've used it once some years back. It comes in a sachet. I think animal care do produce it. It reduces the, 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 the smell. Also, there are some other ingredient you can use even in your commercial feed. I think there are some companies that are producing it now. They came one time to advertise it. I don't want to advertise any company here, but you can use some other things, but make sure you verify because some of those uh, chemicals that are not NAVDAC certified can end up changing so many other things. You're trying to prevent smell, you end up uh, rotting your growth or affecting them to open them to some diseases and what have you. So study the chemical you want to use, make sure it's a reputable company, find out if another person have used it so that you can deploy it for use Benazza. in your farm. So there are so many ways to use to stop that smell. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you again, Dr. Sambu. And um, we are very grateful to have you. Uh, I believe we've learned one or two things in this class. Uh, if we round yeah. up this training with this class, I think we are good. We are fine. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, you are right. Yes, it's, you um, are right. Yes. It's been very instructive. Yeah, but don't worry, we are not ending the training. We have um a topic on um somebody asked about markets, how to market, right? Tomorrow we have a class on sales, um, how to generate sales revenue and digital marketing strategies you can use to get sales.
So tomorrow is going to be another fire. Um, come expectants, come with your pen and paper. And mm. um, it's going to be a good one. That's all I can say. It's going to be a good one. So um, thank you again, Dr. Sambo. Thank you everyone for joining today's class. I think at thank this you. point, we'll call it a day. Call it a day Yeah, today. please allow me to appreciate the wonderful class. No interruption. I really appreciate your maturity, even though the mics are open for anybody to unmute. We do not unmute it to cause distraction. I think this is a wonderful class. I need to appreciate you all for that. Yeah. And thank you for the privilege to talk to you, fellow farmers. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. So um, today's recording will be made available on the channel, I think, tomorrow. Also, yesterday's recording will be made available, I believe, today or tomorrow as well. So um, everything will be made available. And please have a good evening and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you for joining. Cheers. Thank you. 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 Thank you.